when someone introduces an individual by saying they need no introduction and then proceeds with a long introduction, um, you're wondering, well, if they didn't need it, why did you do it? Um, Phyllis, your reputation precedes you. And it is because of the wonderful work and ministry that you're doing and the way in which you're challenging the church today that many persons are inspired and excited about what you have to say and what you share. Phyllis, we all know, is an author of many books. Um, Phyllis is certainly a parent, a mother, a wife, a Eucharistic minister, probably have done everything else there is to be done in the Episcopal Church. But I think it is true to say that for us, Phyllis, you are helping us as a pioneer to really come to grips with what it means to be the church in the 21st century. Do not kid ourselves that we are still a church of the last century. And our willingness to be vulnerable, our willingness to recognize the challenge it is before us to be the church today and not to be afraid to be that church because God's church is in God's hands. It's for us simply to allow ourselves to be the vessels and the instruments that God will use to make God's purpose known. And also to be in tune with what probably God has been saying to us, but we are so preoccupied with our own history, selves, the way we are governed, the way we do things, that we do not want to move out of that comfort zone when God is saying to us, trust me, I'm with you always. So Phyllis, we, we want to say how delighted we are to welcome you here this morning, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to address this gathering. Let's welcome Phyllis Amang. <laughs> I want to do the introduction again. <laughs> I loved it, I have to tell you. I also want to tell you that the Reformation was not in vain. I have in my hand, a, a, oh, there's one back there. I didn't see the clock. I was with the Nebraska Synod of Lutherans about three or four months ago in a room that didn't have a clock. And after three hours, I was still talking and they finally began to get a little restless. And uh, as we were leaving from that three hours before we went back to the afternoon session, they gave me a watch and said, take it wherever you go, it's got a big face, <laughs> which I thought was about as subtle as anything Luther ever did, uh, you know. But I can see that one, so I will leave my watch even. Um, and uh, I, I do, I sort of have a theory that, that the mind can retain only what the bladder can contain. So when, when we've gone too long, just let me know. Theoretically, I'm going to stop at 11 o'clock, but it's very theoretical. Uh, a rector was concerned a little bit. I'm supposed to be up here. I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. R rector was concerned about Q&A as well he should be. Yes, there will be Q&A. Uh, I ask your indulgence, though, if you will let me set up a few things, which will probably take our first session. Uh, and then we will ha have some Q&A. And it may not, I may be able to condense it a little bit, but if you can bear with me just listening for a, a little while until we get some, some groundwork, uh, and then I think we'll have a more productive Q&A. Um, I want to begin this morning a little bit autobiographically, which uh, always troubles me a little bit, but on the other hand, I'm a little more troubled by not beginning that way. Uh, I, I'm a recovering academic. It's a circumstance nobody ever gets over. <laughs> You're gonna, I never saw a footnote I didn't love, um, you know, and, and, and you're gonna catch that. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, I, I loved teaching college until I became an academic dean, and that just kills it right there. And after six years, I woke up one morning and thought, if I have to chair another curriculum committee meeting, I'm gonna kill somebody. And I knew it was time to quit. Uh, and I went from the academy to book publishing. Um, and was head of a, of a number of southern houses as they got bought and sold like that for some 35 or, or, or so years, maybe 38 years, I don't know. Um, and then uh, in 1989, 90, uh, retired at the age of 59, uh, I'm older than God, but um, <laughs> retired in order to write. I don't know what I think a writer is, but I think someday I'm going to learn to do it. 30 books later, uh, I still haven't 
figured out what it is to do that. Anyway, uh, it lasted for 13 months. It lasted for 13 months because a phone call came from Publishers Weekly. Publishers Weekly is uh, the trade journal for uh, the book industry in uh, essentially in the English language, uh, regardless of the country in which it happens. Um, and it was uh, from a woman whom I knew by name because it had been my trade journal for those 35, 36 years. I knew her by name, but not personally in any way. Uh, and she said, we did the usual amenities, and then she said, will you come out of retirement for 18 months and establish a religion department for us? And I said, what? And she said, we've never had a religion department as Publishers Weekly, which I knew, because we've never had any need for one. There's never been any major book publishing in religion done by commercial houses. And as you must be aware, religion books are now leading uh, all of the bestseller list, and I was aware of that, of course. Um, I should say that Harper and Random House had both done some religion publishing, uh, both in our country and the Random House division in yours. Um, but it was primarily for professional people. It was not for John Q. Public. And uh, Daisy Merrillis was absolutely right. Starting by 89, 90, uh, 91, along in there, you see the huge surge in the commercial publishing of religion. It wasn't going to uh, denominational houses. It was going commercial. It was going because we were having some sort of, of sea change, if you will, a shift in what was happening in, in the culture. And so the fact of it is that uh, in 92, 93, Ingram Book Company, which is the largest distributor of books in the continent, uh, probably in the world, everything in your country and in mine that goes to a library, if it goes to you through Amazon, doesn't matter how it goes, goes ultimately through Ingram before it gets to you they had a 243% increase in one fiscal year in the movement of religion products to the countries, to the nation's uh, markets. That's a huge increase. It's a malignant one. When you get that kind of increase, you have to do something. And so it was that uh, Publishers Weekly had to establish a religion department. And indeed, I said, having been reared as a Presbyterian, I got over it when I was 17, but I was reared as a Presbyterian. Um, and so I said to her, let me think about it. I have to pray about it. And she said, oh, God. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, a month later, she called and said, well, we can't wait any longer. And I knew when I got on the airplane, I was going to do it. Uh, and indeed, Publishers Weekly had been around 135 years at that point. It was owned out of Amsterdam by Reeves Elsevier. And I walked in, and they literally said the old line, Here's the checkbook, uh, do what you have to do, but get us a department in 18 months. Uh, and in 18 months, any fool, especially one that's been an academic dean, can establish a department in a well-established magazine. There's not much trick to it. Um, and so we were doing it. But, and the point of all this is, in 18 months, it was very clear that what the industry needed, what Publishers Weekly needed, was not a religion department, though we had that. What they needed was the answer to a very fundamental question. Booksellers and librarians and acquisition editors and publishers, the publishers especially, were calling and there was no politeness about it. They basically said over and over again, tell us what the hell is going on. Because the shift was that dramatic. And when you have that kind of growth, commercially speaking, if you have that kind of growth, you're in real trouble unless you can figure out why it's happening and can do something about it. So within 18 months, I essentially left the position as, I kept the title, but left the position as editor of the religion department and went back to the scholarship, back to the place I thought I had left some 40 years earlier. And the scholarship was there, and it was very clear what we were going through and that it had a pattern to it. Uh, and there was no question about it. The thing about it is, Academic material doesn't matter when academics are talking to academics. It never escapes the uh, academy. But when it takes on a commercial edge, then all of a sudden it begins to seep out and take some urgency, and the scholarship begins to matter. And so I have spent the last 20 years of my life as a student of emergence Christianity, which is what we're here to talk about today. That long story is a way of saying, uh, begging you, Number one, please don't confuse the messenger with the message. This is not necessarily an endorsement or a lack of endorsement of emergence Christianity. 
This is an attempt to, to talk about what's happening and why it's happening and where I think it's going and why it matters to all of us. This is also to say, please understand, that I'm not trying to persuade you of anything. I'm just trying to lay out the facts in such a way that they may or may not be useful to you in, in what you do. I can make you a laundry list of things that concern me about emergence Christianity. I'm not going to because it's a waste of time right now. But there are things that, that concern me, things where I think there's a, uh, an inherent weakness or something we should be concerned about. Uh, and emergence Christians know that. Nonetheless, all of that is a way of sort of setting uh, some framework for it. So together we're going to look at emergence Christianity. And it's G-E-N-C-E. -E. This did not matter until about 18 months ago. And now it matters terribly. We are here to talk about emergence Christianity. G-E-N-C-E. -E. Not emerging, not emergent. None of those words. It's emergence Christianity when you're talking about the overall thing. Now, the central thesis here is well known to some of you because I've already seen some familiar faces. And you've heard the central thesis or you've read some of the material, either mine or, or uh, someone else's. Uh, the central thesis is that about every 500 years, for some reason, about every 500 years, Latinized Christianity or that part of the world that received its Christianity through the Latin language goes through a major upheaval. I don't care whether you call it an upheaval or a reformation or a tsunami or whatever you call it. About every 500 years, we go through a great whooping, if that is a better term, all right? That is to say, we're in the 21st century right now, and if you go back 500 years, you hit the 16th century, no surprise to anybody, and we called it the Great Reformation, right? If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the 11th century, and we called it the Great Schism or the Great Schism, according to where your mama grew up and how she taught you to say it, but it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the 6th century and uh, the Great Decline and Fall. And of course, if you go back 500 from that, you hit the 1st century and what's called the Great Transformation or the Great Transition, one or the other. Both terms apply. They all have picked up their greats. Now, in the beginning, uh, only this great schism was great. Now they're all great because it makes academics happy if everything's fine. So don't leave the greats off. They really matter. Uh, who knows why? We're living in the great emergence. When I say that it happens, it happens not just to the people of God who are involved, and it happens in very specific cultural contexts. That is to say, it happens in that part of the world that was susceptible to receiving its Christianity through the Latin language as opposed to the Syriac and the Greek, or was colonized by those who so received, or was colonialized by those who so received. That is to say, what I have just said sounds a whole lot like westernized world or like first world. Be really careful. That's not true. It's the colonialized and the colonized that also matter. Emergence Christianity came to this continent last. We are the last to receive it. If you want to see it in some of its earlier forms, look, for instance, in South Africa. You can go home and Google Amahoro, A-M-A-H-O-R-O. That's emergence Christianity as it has existed in South Africa for some 40 or 50 years now. Why was it there? Because they had been colonialized uh, by those who received their Christianity through the Latin language. If you want to see it in Malaysia, where it's been quite active for 30 years, it's oh, Malaysia, which I can't spell, but I love to say because it clears the throat. Uh, but but it, it's absolutely there. So it comes to us last. What matters is that we understand this is not a first world phenomenon. This is a phenomenon of, of mindset, if you will, of cultures that were receptive to Latinized Christianity as opposed to other forms of Christianity. And so... Why, why is it that we're susceptible to the 500-year thing? Nobody knows. In all probability, and my undergraduate work was in language, and as many of you know, a language shapes how you think, but in the, uh, it works the other way too. You are susceptible to or receptive of a language if it matches the way in which you think. It's a catch and catch can, or like this. So that there is a segment of the world primarily around the Mediterranean, that was more susceptible to a Latinized way of thinking than to a Syriac or to a Greek way of thinking. 
And so those cultures that came out of that and received their Christianity through that mechanism or thought in such a way that they could receive it go through this thing. Now, having said that very elaborate thing, if there were a rabbi in the room, which I take it there's not, if there were a rabbi in the room, he or she would rise up immediately and say, whoa, it's not a Christian thing you're talking about. It's a Judeo-Christian thing you're talking about. The same 500-year period uh, uh, or cycle also occurs in Judaism. If you go back 500 years from this right here, you hit, of course, the, the Babylonian captivity, the destruction of the temple, and the birth of Second Temple Judaism. If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the end of the Davidic dynasty, uh, of, of uh, the Age of Judges, and the beginning of the Davidic dynasty, out of which Meshul was to come. So they argue very cogently. They argue that uh, because they are in that part, they came from that part of the world that was susceptible to Latinization, that it is a Judeo-Christian phenomenon. If there were an Iman in the room, and I've been interrupted three or four times over the last few years, so I always say it now instead, he would rise up and say, you're not talking about a Judeo-Christian phenomenon, you're talking about an Abrahamic phenomenon. Uh, and he would argue that um, if you start at 650, the year of our Lord 650, Islam evidences the same 500-year cycle. Uh, they choose 650 because it's 650 when you can honestly say, now there is a religion. By 650 of the Common Era, the prophet has dead, of course, and Jerusalem has fallen. Nonetheless, it's about 650 before you can say there is an Islam. Here, here is a religion. We, we can define it. We can see it. And if you go 500 years from 650 and 1,000 and, and now 50, um, 1,500, you will see the same cycling. Um, it's important, I think, uh, for our purposes to understand what the Imams are saying simply because it puts a different perspective on Arab Spring. They are arguing now that they are going through a period not unlike our 15th century, that Islam is entering a time of reformation analogous to what we did 500 years ago. Uh, and there is a good deal of scholarship. If you want to go home and, and see what it's look, uh, look at um, the work of Muhammad Iqbal, uh, I-Q-B-A-L, uh, who is being called now the Martin Luther of contemporary Islam. Or look at uh, Abdul Karman uh, Sarouch, S-O-R-O-U-C-S-H, um, at, uh, at his work. He too is a scholar and they, they are um, concerned now with shaping what Islam is going to be after it goes through this time of reformation and are arguing that what we're seeing in Arab Spring is, is nothing in the world but that same 500-year cycle. Um, the 500-year cycle, let me say, one of you, uh, Phil Cooper, uh, whom I don't see right, but um, Phil was laughing about he had been with Diana Butler Bass last week. Uh, there are um, many um, historians, and she always reminds me of this, trained historians, who get really upset about cycles. Um, the, there is, especially older historians, um, say, you know, cycles can become uh, historic determinism. Be careful about their being there. And they're absolutely right. Having said that, however, let me also go forth and say that systems theory, which is a fairly new division of, uh, of, of science, systems theory has a very uh, a complicated mathematical explanation for why we do this thing every 500 years. And they say, absolutely, it will probably continue. We are trapped in some kind of, of thing. So it's going to continue to go around. I, I received a letter uh, last week from a young man whom I had known when he was in seminary. And he said, this will either spook you or confirm you or just simply turn you off. Uh, but I am preaching on the Second Kings. And I discovered that in Second Kings, the sixth chapter, the first verse, uh, it, it, very quiet, uh, it very quietly says that um, uh, it's 480 years after the exile, uh, Solomon decided to build a temple. And I thought, 480 years, isn't that interesting? And then if you go to 2 Kings 9, 10, you discover that it was 20 years building and 500 years after the return from exile, he consecrated the temple. Uh, and he said, if that doesn't spook you, then, you know, there you are. Uh, and I said, all right, I think it may spook me. It's a little too much. It's like, uh, you know, some kinds of prophecy that make you nervous. N uh, nonetheless, uh, the 500-year thing is there. What we have to remember about it is that it's not just about religion. Because we are people involved in religion, we tend to see these things in terms of religion. It is instead 
everything in the society involved changes, including religion. That is to say, the Reformation is better known to us than many other things, so let's take the Reformation. If you will remember, even in high school, when they taught you the Reformation, they said, the Reformation, uh, it is the birth of individualism. Uh, it is uh, the coming of humanism. It's the beginning of a new renaissance. It is the rise of the middle class. It's the institutionalization of capitalism. It's the rise of the nation state, right? Remember all these things? And oh, by the way, it brought us Protestantism. We are in a thing called the great emergence, and it's affecting every single part of what we do. And by the way, it's bringing us emergence Christianity, all right? We have to keep the emphasis in the right place. Society informs the religion that exists in it, and religion is informed by and informs the society. It's a two-way street. You cannot separate the two. It is the function of religion to inform and give meaning to the society in which it exists, but it is the function of the society also to shape religion. So you're not going to ex uh, extrapolate. You're not going to pull Protestantism out of the Reformation. You're not going to pull emergence Christianity out of the great emergence. But you have to understand that it's far more than just religion. The great emergence, uh, the great emergence in which we live, is it simply a time in which everything has so dramatically changed that your grandfather, or at the most your great-grandfather, could no more endure or live in the world you live in right now than he could fly to the moon, right? It has changed that much. It is the great, emer it is the thing after the it is the great emergence that Thomas Friedman 10 years ago could write a book called The World is Flat and we all knew what he was talking about. It's the great emergence that you and I, speaking English, have five times more words than William Shakespeare had when he wrote the plays, for goodness sakes. It's the great emergence that in, in my country, in 1900, there were 8,000 cars total in the whole country. There are 8,000 years of cars between here and Young Avenue, for goodness sakes, right now, right. It, it's the great emergence that the average Caucasian male only lived to be 47 years old uh, in 1900. And, and, and now we live forever, right? It's a condition we probably should not have acquired. Uh, you know, we might have been better off without it. Uh, and it. It's the great emergence that if you read the New York Times on uh, the day after tomorrow, from cover to cover, you're going to be exposed to more information than the average privileged 19th century gentleman had in his whole lifetime. You will also need a stiff drink when you finish, but that's a different issue. <laughs> yeah, it's more than you ever wanted to know. It's the great, it, 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 it's the, it's the great emergence, it's the great emergence that in my country, um, this year, 2012, over half of the babies born to women under 30 will be born out of wedlock deliberately. That's the great emergence. Which means she wants the baby and not the nuisance, and I understand that, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do, I, I, I do understand that. But think of what a shift that is. It's the great emergence that in your country and in mine both, in both our countries, the average one of us lives at least 40 miles away from the place where he or she was born, which is to say that the conservatory or transmitting effect of the village is gone. It's not there. We've lost grandma in some significant ways. We've lost those ties. It's also true that in your country and in mine, the average one of us, other than clergy who are exempt from this, will change jobs at least five times in our working lives. I don't mean getting a promotion. I mean change the area in which you are actually working. It's the great emergence that this year, in honor of 2012, the Great China Brain Project, which is owned jointly by IBM, the Chinese government, with some money from the U.S. government, the Great China Brain Project is going to go through 12 petaflops. Now, I'm about to tell you what one of those things is. I don't even understand what I'm about to say. A petaflop is when a computer can make a quadrillion decisions or choices within one second accurately. If you do 12 of them, you're doing 12 quadrillion procedures accurately in one second. If you lined everybody in Toronto together and hooked us up to some kind of mighty machine, we haven't got a prayer, all of us together, of arriving at that kind of acuity or accuracy, right? 
that we can't. It is totally beyond us. The machine now exceeds, and we all know it, even though we don't admit it. The machine now exceeds our ability to think. And the result is there can no longer be experts. One of the major characteristics of emergence Christianity is it no longer can be hierarchical. It can no longer be top down. Those of us who are stuck in Anglicanism are blessed with a lot of bishops and mid judicatories. Well, we're not quite sure what we're going to do with those. Where are you, Peter? Uh, you know, uh, but, but in, a, in a world of that kind of, of mechanized ability, there is no way any of us can be an expert. Our only hope is to work communally so that we can bring our little bit and their little bit and his little bit and her little bit to a common pool and try to arrive at some sort of understanding of what, how things are and how they work. That's what it, it's all about. It, it's, the great, it's the great emergence that the average youngster who in, entered technological college uh, in September will have everything he or she learned totally obviated by the time he or she gets to the junior year. Obviated completely out of, of, of no use, simply because we've changed that much. It's the great, it's thing after thing. It's the great emergence, because most of us are Anglican, it's the great emergence that at the end of the day, when you go home, you've just absolutely heard so much and learned so much, you don't want to know another thing, right? You know, just don't, please don't tell me another thing. Uh, and all you want to do is go, go home and go back to the kitchen and have a conversation with Jack. I'm from Tennessee, and that would be Jack Daniel, which is the only whiskey made. All right. Let's get our chauvinistic things here. Yeah. And when you go to have a conversation with Jack, what's the first thing you do? Inevitably, you stop in the living room or the den or somewhere and turn on the home machine so it can begin to warm up, right? So when Jack makes you feel better, you can come back and learn some more. Uh, that's pathetic. That's really pathetic. Yeah. But that's, that's who we are. That's the great emergence in every way. Now, the great emergence is not necessarily entirely something that should make us hang our heads in, in concern, but it's something that should scare us. Uh, or at least it's a, there are some things about it that should scare us. It should scare us, for instance, that two-thirds of the human genome is now owned and under patent by corporations. Businesses now own two-thirds of what we're going to be. That should worry us. That should worry us in terms of the ethics of what the church is teaching and providing, if nothing else. But then there's some funny things, too. I have a colleague whom I've never met. We all have dear friends and colleagues, right, on Facebook whom we've never met but know intimately. I love it. Um, and th she has a wicked sense of humor, and she every once in a while sends me a list of things about the great emergence that she thinks are funny. And she sent me 15 in November, first of the month, uh, and uh, three of them I thought were a hoot. Uh, the first one that I really liked was she said, you know you're living in the great emergence when you have 15 cell phone numbers for your three-member family. You know you're living in the great emergence, number two, when the first thing you do when you turn into your driveway is pull out your cell phone and call somebody in the house to come help you with the groceries. Absolutely. <laughs> The one I absolutely loved was, though, she said, you know you're living in the great emergence if you poke your pin number into the microwave and can't figure out why the damn thing doesn't turn on. <laughs> Which, so it's, it's, it's not all storm and stress. There's some good things here, all right, that are happening. Uh, but it's, it, it's such a disjuncture, it's as, as severe a disjuncture that we're living through now as it was in the 16th century when the Reformation came along. And the first thing we have to understand in all of this so far, first 20 minutes here, is that we, everything in life has gone whoo, like this. Every single part of life in, within our lifetime has gone like this. Now, I want to uh, bore you just a minute or be tedious because we can't go any farther until I'm a little bit tedious. I'm talking about emergence Christianity as part of the great emergence. And by the way, the great emergence is going to be dated from 9-11, whether we like it or not. We all know that the Reformation didn't start on October the 20, uh, 30, 31st of, of, uh, 1517. It just didn't, right? That's an academic convenience. That's the day that Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses. And an academic said, oh, there it is. We now have a Reformation. We can date it from here. Well, that's, you know, not true. 
Obviously, it didn't come... It was just as present on the day of, of October 30th, 1517, as it was on October 31st. It, it, you know, but that's the date that we conveniently hook into. The date that history is a prob a probably going to hook into uh, for the great emergence is unfortunately 9-11. I say unfortunately because it seems to me, well, unfortunate in many ways. Uh, there must be a better date, but that's the one we're going to use, uh, it looks like. So 9-11, C, is the date in which we're going to say, now we're into the great emergence. And now we have emergence Christianity. I want to now do a little sidebar because I have to. It really didn't matter 18 months ago. It probably didn't matter 15 months ago, but it sure matters now. We say, all of us are comfortable saying, that the Reformation gave us an expression of Christianity called Protestantism, right? And we know what Protestantism is, right? We can all sit here and we can make a list of sensibilities that fall under that rubric. We know what it is. Uh, we also know that under that rubric there are Methodists and there are Presbyterians and there are Baptists and there are Lutherans and yada de yada de yada de. Actually, worldwide, there are over 39,000 distinct divisions. That is, divisions of Protestantism distinguishable from each other. In my country, there are 37,647, as a matter of fact, all sufficiently distinguishable from each other so that our Internal Revenue Service recognizes them as different for tax purposes. That's a malignant kind of divisiveness. Nonetheless, they're there. And nobody ever thinks that all Protestants are Methodists. Nor, like, only the Baptists think that, and they tend to think, you know, <laughs> but <clears throat> God love them, God love them. So, but we recognize those distinctions while we recognize the overarching rubric. In the same way, in the same way, where did I put it? I'm very bad about pens. In the same way, there is an overarching rubric called Emergence Christianity. And if you can read that, you're wonderful. And it has under it at least eight or ten entirely distinguishable and distinct from each other divisions. They didn't used to be. Now they have been. They have become distinct. And I'm going to list them, but I'm going to do it here so you can have some hope of seeing. That is, under that overarching rubric, there is a thing called emerging Christianity. It is a division of this. It is not a freestanding unto its, it is not a name for the overall thing. It is a name for a distinct division. Emerging church or emerging Christians or emerging Christianity. There is one called emergent, and here is where the cheese has become binding. Emergent, E-N-T, as opposed to I-N-G. They are separate. They are becoming more and more separate from each other. If you will remember, those of you who were in seminary, your church history, you will remember that in 1529, 17 years after the, uh, uh, 12 years after the Reformation had actually happened, Zwingli and Luther had been fighting with each other in such a way they were not getting along at all. Uh, and they finally took eight of their fellow churchmen and they retired to Marburg Castle or Palace in an attempt to, to resolve their differences. And after five days there, trying to meet together and discern what God was telling them, they realized they were never going to resolve their differences. They were going to be different expressions of, of Protestantism, of the Reformation faith. And so it was that history tells us that Martin Luther, God loved Luther, Luther walked out and stood on the grounds uh, at Marburg and he pointed back to the building like this and he said, that man, meaning Zwingli, that man is such a low swine, I would not give him the swill out of my kitchen garden if I could help it. So much for Christian charity, right? You know, it's a beautiful example of what happens. It is a sign of maturation when you get that kind of animosity, unfortunately. But it is a sign of maturation. Which means it's easy to love a new baby. A baby is dark. It's hard as hell to like a two and a half year old. And that's what we're talking about here. What has happened is that the tension here has become acute and the separation, there's a reason for it. Part of emergence Christianity's original uh, energy came from, especially in the UK here and in the US, uh, came from uh, evangelicals 
who were disaffected with part of what evangelicalism had become. And they wanted to infuse evangelicalism, or Christianity, if you will, with some of the sensibilities of the great emergence, combined with some of the doctrine, if you will, of evangelicalism, or some of the fervor of evangelicalism, if you will. And so they became emerging. They became emerging. Then there was another division of evangelicals who became emergent, and they went their two separate ways. In my country, if, uh, if the names will mean anything to emerging is best seen um, by Mark Driscoll, whom you may have heard of at Mars Hill in Seattle. Yes, some of you are saying yes. Emerging now is more and more wanting to, and D.A. Carson is perhaps their best known uh, uh, theologian, if that means anything to you. Scott McKnight is moving in the emerging direction. They've become, they are going back more and more. They are now homophobic. They are no longer gender inclusive. They want the Bible to be factual instead of actual. In pressure back against that, emergent is becoming more and more homophilia, more and more gender inclusive, more and more concerned with the actuality of scripture, or emphasis on the actuality of scripture instead of its uh, factuality. They are drawing the lines between them. They are probably the two best known divisions of emergence Christianity. The third one that is well known is neo-monasticism. Neo-monastics absolutely fascinate me. There are thousands of neo-monastic communities in your country and thousands in mine. They fascinate me for two or three reasons. Number one, they're the fastest growing segment of emergence Christianity. Uh, number two, they are the first to actually arrive uh, all by themselves at some kind of international presence. It is web-based. There is no central office, there's no Rome, there's no Canterbury. It is all web-based. But there is an international community of communities, if you want to go look it up when you get home. The community of communities is, is a web, if you will, of all of these monastic communities. They were first probably, uh, they got their first public presence, if you will, uh, I think with Ian Mobsby uh, in the UK, uh, whose work, if you don't know it, I suggest you, you look up and see what Father Mosby is doing. They also fascinate me because they are the first branch of emergence Christianity to go back to Mother Church, Antioch going back to Jerusalem, and saying, will you help us? Will you show us what we need to do? That is to say that even as you and I speak, or I speak and you listen, uh, in London itself, uh, the, uh, many of the neo-monastics in the UK are meeting with monastics in established medieval orders to begin to talk about what the similarities are and what these new young things can learn from the old traditions uh, of monastic living. They fascinate me also because they are the first division of emergence Christianity to arrive at something close to a liturgy or the beginning of liturgical literature. Uh, they published a thing called, you'll love this, common, a book of common prayer for ordinary radicals. It's a doorstopper of a book. It's this thick, right? But it is an attempt to arrive at a book of common prayer that will suit neo-monasticism, that, uh, that will reflect the sensibilities of emergence, but will actually give it heft uh, in some way. That's remarkable. It is gone, it's been out now about 18 months. It's gone through eight or nine printings. Uh, it, so that the fact that they now have uh, some sort of form, if you will. A neo-monastic can be a member of a community of three or four people uh, who have no more commitment than every Tuesday night we're going to come together and we will pray for three hours together. Or it can go to common purse, or it can go to common purse and common table, or it can even go all the way to obedience and chastity. It's the whole spectrum of what it means. At the base of it, they all share a vowedness. They are all vowed to each other before God in some way. Uh, they, many of them draw up a rule of life, but you don't always have to. They're an important element in what's happening. The next ones who, who absolutely fascinate me are the hyphenated. For all my long lead in about the fact that I'm not an emergence Christian, I'm a student of it, I have to tell you I may also die, I, I may be a hyphenated. I just may be. Uh, I'm not ever leaving Anglicanism. When I die, I want a guy or a gal in a skirt smelling of incense to say the words over me. So that's perfectly clear, right? <laughs> I don't want to go to heaven unscented. 
uh, and I sure don't want to go to heaven smelling of beer. Uh, you know, nonetheless, nonetheless, the hyphenated are those who don't entirely want to leave the natal tradition, but who do want to infuse it with the sensibilities of emergence living. And originally they were, in our case, Anglo emergents, A-N-G-L-O hyphen, M-E-R-G-E-N-T-S, or metho emergents, which always sounds like a bad drug to me, M-E-T-H-O G-E-N. They lost the hyphens about three or four years ago. Uh, and self-consciously, at a meeting in Memphis, self-consciously said, you know, we don't want, if we lose the hyphens, that's fine, but we, the only other choice would be to be hybrids, and we don't want to be hybrids, and so we're going to stick with the name hyphenated, and so they have, even though it's all spelled now as one word. If you want to see them for uh, our communion, for the Anglican communion, look up Anglo Emergence, or look up Anglo Emergent Village, if you will, and, and you will see, uh, you will see what, what they are like. Anyway, um, they're there. They fascinate me because they really do want to take they want to take the thing that was good out of, out of the church and move it over here into new territory. They're not unlike Paul to me, Paul and Barnabas, trying to make that transition between the two. They're the people probably as active clergy you need to be most concerned with. They don't want to lose you. On the other hand, they want you to understand who they are. They would even like, possibly, if you could, for you to provide a service or two for them off-site, not in your nave, but somewhere with some sort of blessing. And we're going to touch that again later because it's an important part of what Jerusalem can do for Antioch. Uh, in, in addition to this, there's the Fresh Expressions, which started out in Canterbury <laughs> under the aegis of Archbishop Rowan Williams, uh, and then became a kind of sui generis. Uh, that is to say, it has become a thing unto itself. It's not exactly a hyphenated. It's just a new expression of emergence Christianity that doesn't play by anybody's rules or anybody's expectations. It's worldwide and international. Google it and you'll be absolutely amazed uh, at, at the strength of this thing and what it has become. I do not know the figures for your country. I don't think they have been drawn up. But let me tell you right now, uh, that uh, we have figures in the states, we've had them now for about two years, about the size of what we're talking about. That is to say that Barna Research Group, which uh, is, I, I think, hands down, far and away, the best demographer in religion, um, from my point of view anyway, in that instead of taking a thesis and going out to the street to see if they can prove it, they go out to the street and find out what's there and come back and draw a thesis. There's a huge difference in the result when you take that approach. Um, and Barna, uh, you, if you walk up to somebody and say, are you an emergence Christian? They're gonna say, good God, no. Uh, you know, um, what kind of question is that? But Barna went into the streets in the US. I think it's just the US. It may have been North America. I think it's just the US. And I'm gonna stick with that because that's my memory anyway. There are 114 words to the item, to the question. I've seen the instrument. But basically, this is what it says. They walked up to people and said, have you at least twice in the last month had a religious or spiritual experience in the company of two or more other people who are not in any way affiliated with an established arm of religion in a space that is in no way affiliated with an established arm of religion? The answer to that, yes by 32.8% of my fellow Americans. That's the size of what we're talking about here, all right? Now, let me quickly say, there is such a thing as emergence Judaism, and Barna did not ask, are you Jewish or Christian? There's also such a thing as Wiccan, uh, and they did not ask, are you Wiccan or Christian? But 32.8% of my fellow citizens, and I think my fellow Americans, are falling somewhere in one of these categories. That's what they... This is too large a demographic to ignore, is what I'm saying. This is a demographic that we have to deal with because it is so huge. Now, there are other divisions here also. There's a thing called deep church. There's a thing called missional church. There's a thing called small church. There is, and I'm afraid we won't get to it, I don't know, we may try. There is a huge thing called cyber church for which I also have figures. 20 million of my fellow Yankees had their whole religious experience last year on the web. 
They're cyber Christians. Never went in bricks and mortar. The whole thing was in cyberspace. And we will talk about them if we have time. Uh, in addition, in addition, and right down here, there is a new thing happening or an old thing rehappening. I'm not quite sure which. There is a division here or else there is a new thing called convergence Christianity. Right now, I'm pretty sure it's a division of emergence. Those who are in it would like to think that they're a different, that eventually emergence will be seen as an expression of convergence, Christianity. Emergence, uh, the great emergence has had various and sundry names over the years. Uh, there's been an attempt to call it the fifth awakening, uh, the fourth great awakening. There's been an attempt to call it uh, the fifth turning. There's a good book by, called by that name. Uh, it, it's been your um, your economist Richard Flora, Florida wants to call it the Great Reset, which I think is admirable. Uh, the president of the American Historical Association, uh, a man named Charles Brownbaugh, who was an enormously prominent uh, historian in the '60s, um, was made president of the American Historical Association and gave his inaugural address in 1962 in Chicago about how we should call this thing the Great Mutation which I'm really glad didn't happen because then we'd have mutation Christianity, which would really be unpleasant. Uh, I'm not sure emergence is the best, and emergence Christianity is the best word for it, but that's what we've got. And those who are dealing with convergence are very interested in trying to get rid of the word emergence because it, it's an awkward word in every way, and to rename the whole thing convergence. As I say, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen or not. Convergence Christianity matters to us right now, however, because it's what's left over or what's being remade or readjusted or whatever out of progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity, as you must know, progressive Christianity came out of the last century and became more and more intellectualized, more and more concerned with social justice and social issues, and less, and, and, and I think it's fair to say, farther and farther removed from, the, from basic New Testament gospel. That's not quite fair. I don't know how to do it. The only study of progressive Christianity in, in, in the world right now, the only study of progressive Christianity as it goes through this reconfiguration is by Dr. Rebecca King, and it's her doctoral dissertation taken at the University of Toronto. Uh, she is now uh, in postdoc work at Emory University, and I've been in correspondence with her for some time now. Uh, in which she traces the fact that as progressive Christianity began to become more and more uh, ethical and less and less religious, more and more concerned with, being, with losing uh, religion in, in order to find a Christianity that was free of religion, as it did those things, it, it, became, um, it became a kind of sui generis, if you will. It became less and less appealing. And therefore, emergence uh, Christianity is a movement. On, and Diana Butler Bass is part of this. Uh, and uh, uh, McLaurin, uh, Brian McLaurin, is interested in this movement also. So, so much for terminology. These are the things we're going to be talking about. And you can't conflate them. You can't make them all the same thing. Now, if every 500 years we do this thing, then there is internal to the 500 years there is internal to the 500 years a cycle itself. That is to say, every 500 years we do this, and every 500 years when we do this, there is one resounding question. Where now is the authority? What gets lost at Wittenberg? What got lost at 9-11? What got lost uh, in, 50, in 1051? What got lost is a sense of who's making the rules. Who now, who will tell us how, how now shall we live? Who will tell us what meaning is? Who will tell us what the rules are? There's the loss of authority. And every time we do one, then the question is, where now is our authority? And then we have about 100 years to answer the question. And after we've answered the question, we have about 250 years in which we all agree 
that the answer we have is the right answer. Not that we like it, but that it is the answer. You know, we reserve the right to not like it, as a matter of fact, but it's there. And then we have 150 years in which bit by bit, we chip away at the authority until all of a sudden we don't have authority anymore and we're back again to the tsunami. We're back again to the recycling of the thing, to the beginning of the thing. If you will, I want you to look with me, if you will, at the Reformation, because again, it's more familiar to us. The Reformation didn't begin on October 31st, 1517. The Reformation actually began about 150 years before October 31st, 1517. To give it its academic name, that 150 years is called the Perry. The Perry Reformation, the Perry Emergence, the Perry Schism. I call it a tick up because it's a whole lot more fun. But it's 150 years in which the tension builds. Now coming out of the Great Schism, uh, as we all know, when East and West separated, suddenly Rome became the be-all and end-all of Western Christianity. It's all in Rome, you know. Everything, all authority rests with the Pope, rests with the Curia, rests with the Magisterium. And we've got authority, and we know what we're doing, and we know who's going to tell us how to live. Or we do until we get to about 1390. Some people would say, actually, that the Refer Perry Reformation began with John Wycliffe. Uh, I think that's probably a stretch. John Wycliffe dies in 1358. Uh, and the argument goes that because he translated the Bible into English, um, it was the beginning of the Reformation. That Bible didn't make that much of an impact at that time, I don't think, at a popular level. So I'm more content with 1390. Having said that, though, you will find people who do what I do, who will say you start with Wycliffe in, in 1358. I will absolutely admit that he did something that sure did anger somebody. Because in 1414, the Council of Constance dug the poor man up and burned what they dug up and then threw it all in the river, which means he royally pissed somebody, if you will forgive my saying so, <laughs> which is a good sign you've done something. But by 1390, what you've got is three armed popes, Urban, Clement, and Alexander, running around the north part of Italy and the south part of Europe, all claiming the chair of Peter. And it is at that point that the whole thing loses credibility. Uh, those men are armed to the hilt, they are burning, they are pillaging, they are raping, they are devastating, all in the name of the chair of Peter, all saying, uh, God has chosen me to be the next pope. I am the, the next Peter. Now, unless God's schizophrenic, two of them are wrong. Uh, and, and it's unlikely. It, even the dumbest serf, uh, most illiterate, could figure out this wasn't, this wasn't working. Um, and so you begin the destruction, if you will, of the papacy and the courier and the magisterium as the sole source of authority. They just, it's not going to work. And, and you go from there straight on, and, and you know it as well as I do. By, 1450, by the 1450s, um, you, you've got Constantinople falling. You've got the reintroduction into Europe of all of the wealth of the classical literature, all of which had gone to Constantinople to be preserved. Europe had been in the Dark Ages. We get the Septuagint. What a concept. We've got the Bible back. We get Plato and Aristotle. Plato should have stayed in Constantinople, but Aristotle was okay. Uh, you know, uh, we get all of this. We get, uh, in the latter part of that decade, we get some idiot, clearly not an Anglican, who took a perfectly good wine press and, and put, you know, paper in it instead of grapes. We would never have done that. But nonetheless, <laughs> he did it, you know? Uh, we wouldn't have. Come on, let's get holy here. Uh, you know, no, but anyway, uh, and, and in, in many ways, the internet has been, in our Perry uh, emergence, analogous to the printing press in the Perry Reformation. That's a fair thing to say. I need to sidebar here, though, and say uh, that only about 7,000 things were actually printed on that printing press from the time uh, Gutenberg started it uh, uh, until the Reformation itself, from Gutenberg to, to Luther. There were only about 7,000 documents. 6,000 of them were theologians talking to theologians which honestly really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I mean, the, it, it goes like this. It's like an Cuisinart. It stays within itself, and it, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't. It's cynical, but it, only, a, only a failed academic can make that kind of crap, but it's absolutely true. Uh, it makes no difference. A thousand of them, however, and this is part of the genius of the Reformation, 
A thousand of them were sheet music. Uh, that is to say, Luther and company were smart enough to know that in an illiterate population, you could talk theology till the cows came home, and you could write noble theses, and it wouldn't matter a bit. It just wouldn't. But if you could find one man in a village who could both carry a tune and read, all you had to do was reduce the new theology to him. Uh, and then he taught it to the people by singing. And those, a mighty fortress is our God, that's Luther being subversive, you know? Uh, that all of those marvelous hymns were what brought the Reformation in. And the reason I sidetrack here is that one of the things the established church, the traditional church, you and me, one of the things we fail to understand from the 70s on um, was that the music makes all the difference in the world. The music makes all the difference in the world. The music makes all the difference in the world. One more praise song and I'm going to kill somebody, right? You know, but, but that's exact. it got carried that way. Uh, this one got carried in the same way. It's the music. Uh, I was reading in, in Christianity Today uh, on the plane up here a review of a new book by the uh, president of the American Guild of Church Organists uh, in which she is dealing with the fact that there's huge animosity all over the known world, huge animosity between rectors and their organists. Uh, I thought it was a light-breaking news bulletin. Um, <laughs> y you know, uh, and, and part, a part of that animosity has to do with the fact that when you get right down to it, people 40 and under who are emergence, citizens of the great emergence, regardless of where they stand religiously, they are citizens of the great emergence. They have emergence sensibilities. They can't help it. They were born in the great emergence. They're not going to sit down for a whole lot of performed music. They're just not. You, they want incarnational music. They want music that they can feel. They want something they can move to. And you just can't move short of the hallelujah chorus. You can't move to much, much of what comes out of that thing. Oh, this is good over here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's that's going to play in Poughkeepsie. Uh, you know, so that uh, our failure to deal with, with the music and the... But anyway, um, we, we got the printing press, we got all of that. By, by 1507, there's evidence that Copernicus was circulating his ideas uh, about the structure of the universe. He was smart enough not to publish them until after Luther took the heat uh, at Wittenberg. But nonetheless, those ideas were there. I always stop, and, and to the point maybe of boredom, those of you who've heard this before, but I'm going to stop again. I want to stop at 1492. 1492 is that part of the Perry Reformation where some idiot sailed uh, west on a flat earth and didn't fall off the sucker, uh, which was unfortunate. Now, you and I both know that nobody in 1492, very few people, were stupid enough to think the earth was flat. Uh, they just didn't. Uh, I mean, it, Columbus had reasons for going. Uh, you know, he wasn't just off the foot. It didn't matter whether it was flat or not. What mattered was that the church taught it was flat. It taught a universe like this in layers with the earth as this and flat earth. It was perfectly all right to watch from the shore and see a boat go over the horizon and know in your heart of hearts that it was going somewhere and that it was around earth and then go to church and believe in this because there was no reason to, to disassociate the two until Columbus was stupid enough to prove that the church was wrong. When he proved that the church was wrong, all of a sudden you're in crisis because something you've been told from the get-go was true is now clearly shown to not be true. There are in London, I am told, I have not seen them, I am told in London there are two or maybe three uh, written records of what I'm about to say, which is that Assume that you are 62, 63, 64 years old uh, in 1493 or 94, and you're now having to deal with the fact that the world isn't this way, it's not stacked this way, that it's this way. And now the church is wrong. You spent your whole life and gambled your soul on this, and now it's not true. And why does it matter? And this is where the records would break your heart. It matters that if the earth is like this, it's like this instead of like this, and I die in, in, in England, if I die in London, in the town of London, and I ascend in a round universe, and my Lord died 1,400, 1,500 years ago in Jerusalem, and it's a round universe, he ascended this way. 
and I will never see my Lord. That's a heartbreak. Do you understand what I'm saying? Those two or three written le uh, records bear hugely emotional, or poignant, if you will, testimony to the fact that whatever you and I do as church people, however we may inform ourselves about what's going on, however correct we may be about what's happening, we still have a pastoral obligation to remember that those who do not see what we see are going to be hurt by our rightness. Rightness is a very serious thing to possess, or correctness, if you want to give it its word. It is not enough to be correct unless you can be correct pastorally. And there are thousands of people who have built their lives on a different kind of Christianity, who have built their lives on a Protestant, on a, on a literalist, on an inerrancy uh, basis, and they have to be respected for what they have done. It's not enough to just go in and cut them off at the knees. Uh, we can't do that. We must not do that. Whatever else we do with what we do today. Nonetheless, the Reformation came. The Reformation came because, and it, it, it came out of all of those things. What I want to do now is to look in the same way at the Perry emergence. Uh, I want to look at the years that preceded 9-11. I want to begin with the year 1842, 3, and 4. Those are the years in which a young chemist named Michael, uh, uh, Michael Faraday, those of you who watch Lost are aware that Faraday is one of the characters in Lost, that's why. Michael Faraday was a chemist who retired in 42, who went to his study at home in 43, and in who in 44 published field theory. That is to say, he is the father of everything we are today. It begins with Faraday. It was Faraday who uh, said, you know, I can tell you what electricity is. I can write you a formula that will indeed explain it. I can show you what the field is that electricity works in. I can show you conductivity. I can write you the math that explains conductivity. I can tell you about gravity. I can't give it a formula yet, but I can tell you that it works on a field principle. And he was off and running because the minute he did that, several things happened. First, he opened the ability, he opened our ability to understand electricity and to begin to use it. Everything in this room has been affected by the work of Faraday. There are very few human beings you can say that of. But Faraday's work, even if you are dressed in pure cotton, I'll guarantee you at some point that cotton was touched by electricity. It was woven on an electric wound or it, uh, a loom, or, or it was tagged with an electric machine at some point, or it was sewn with one. Everything, the internet is born in 1842, 43, 44. Once we do, the second thing is the minute Faraday does that, to put it jocularly, Jove or Zeus ceases to throw the thunderbolts. That is to say, oh, it's our first realization that there are physical rules. It is the birth of, si of physical science in many significant ways. The Reformation gave us Newtonian. I'm not saying there wasn't science before. Macrophysics was born with Newton. There's no question about that. But, micro but physics as we understand it, the universe as we understand it, the science that with which we deal every day is born with Faraday. And the minute he does that, he takes the first major chip if you will, in the authority of, uh, of the Bible. Why does he do that? Because in 1517, uh, when the Reformation actually began, there was that, stall, that silence, all right? You have, taken, you have gotten rid of the papacy. You've gotten rid of the curia. You've gotten rid of the magisterium Luther. Now where is our authority? And Luther answered that question, as you all know, by saying, sola scriptura, scriptura sola. Only the scriptures and the scriptures only. Now, you also know that he had five solas, which means that he didn't understand Latin or he was confused or, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I love to laugh at Luther. He was so wonderful and so risible. But sola scriptura was the one that stuck. And for the years from Luther, from about uh, 1530, Right up till Faraday, 
it was sola scriptura, only the scripture and the scripture only. Now, more than one scholar has observed several times that what Luther did was get rid of a flesh and blood pope and put a paper one in his place. And that's a fair statement. Luther, however, should not be blamed for what happened to sola scriptura. What happened to sola scriptura was biblical inerrancy or Protestant inerrancy uh, or li Protestant literalism, whatever you want to call it, Protestant. That's what the Enlightenment gave us out of sola scriptura. That is to say, when you say that a book is going to make all the rules, when you say that all of your authority is going to be in a book, you have to be able to read that book in order to know what the authority is, right? Inherent in saying sola scriptura, scriptura sola, very clear in Luther's mind and everybody else's, is that we must now have universal literacy. Every man must be able to read for himself and every woman to read for herself. And so what you get is the frantic business on the part of Protestantism, God be praised, to make every one of us able to read. And literacy begins. Now there's two things that are wrong with literacy. The first is when you, when you give people a book and say, this is the word of God, two people are going to get together and they're going to agree on what that word says. And two others are going to get together and they're going to agree, but not with each other. And then there's going to be the fifth one who doesn't agree with any of the above and needs a partner and is going to go find it. This is how you get divisiveness. This is how you get 39,000 some odd worldwide product. That's what happens. And so what you get is a splintering. In, in addition, when you get the splintering, and of course you get the enlightenment out of, of that push toward literacy, it's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, we're glad to have the enlightenment. We're glad we've lived off of the product of it. But nonetheless, you get not only all these groups, but you get them armed to the hilt. We are right. Because if, you, if your group disagrees with my group, then one of us is wrong, and it's my soul, so you've got to be wrong because I'm right. Right? And you get the viciousness of the division. I was talking to one of our bishops about six months ago, and he said with a perfectly straight face, there is nothing wrong with Protestant inerrancy except the Protestant part and the inerrant part. The rest is just fine. Uh, and, and I said, you're absolutely right. And he said, there wouldn't be anything wrong with biblical inerrancy if you, somebody could figure out what the Bible was. Uh, and he was right about that too. If you go to Amazon Canada or Amazon anywhere else, you'll discover something like 200 different editions of the Bible. Uh, and they all are different from one another. Otherwise, there wouldn't be listed as separate editions. So what is the Bible? Where, where is it? And so that, that thing, that biblical inerrancy thing, had commanded and become the authority right up until you get to Faraday. And when you get to Faraday, and he suddenly starts monkeying with all this stuff, and some of what the Bible says appears to be nearer to Zeus throwing thunderbolts than it is to Faraday and his theory of electricity, which is held up. And so you begin to get the first push against Protestant inerrancy. You get the first major chip. It's going to be followed in 1859 by a man named Darwin, whom you may have heard of. Uh, Darwin, uh, with, who was training for the Anglican priesthood, who was a devout Christian. Um, and... Uh, we cured him, by the way we treated him. He died an atheist. Uh, nonetheless, Darwin, who really thought he was praising God by describing what wonderful thing he had discovered, the origin, of, you know, survival of the fittest, the origin of the species, uh, and, and who was devout in every way, uh, initially, anyway. But what was heard, again, we're back to Columbus, what was heard was not what Darwin said. What was heard was the fact that we are descended from monkeys, but we are made in the image of God, it must therefore follow that the man saying God is a monkey, and that's intolerable. Uh, and so we were off and running. And these are two major chips away. Now, in between, there is the beginning of uh, the erosion, if you will, or within the peri-emergence, the erosion of Sola Scriptura that begins in the years 1855 and goes to the years 1859. And they deal with what we in my part of North America call the recent great unpleasantness, uh, that is the Civil War, uh, the lead up to our Civil War. I want, when we come back from break, 
to begin with these four years and do what's called a sociological cascade. I want, you, I want to trace with you, uh, during the peri-emergence, soci the sociological attack on Sola Scriptura, the erosion, if you will, in terms of pure sociology, of what was happening during those years. Now, you can do any number of cascades. You can do, for instance, a political cascade. Those of you who are well, tracking with me here are aware that there's a guy named Karl Marx who comes in here, right? It's the birth of communism is part of the peri emergence. It sure is. Um, you can do it artistically, and it'll take you right up to Pablo Picasso, uh, where you can trace the fact that we become more and more objectified as we lose more and more of our sense of what a human being is. You can trace it uh, aesthetic. There are all kinds of ways to trace it. I want to trace it sociologically, though. And I want to begin with those years between uh, Faraday uh, and, and Darwin and disestablish Protestant inerrancy or biblical inerrancy. Before I do that, though, and before we break, I want to tell you one last story. I have said several times, and nobody winced, uh, that uh, emergence Christians are far more interested in the Bible's being actual than in its being factual. Uh, it is one of the characteristics of emergence, whether they are in your pews and trying to behave, or whether they're in pubs and doing pub theology, or whether they're in apartments meeting at night. One of the major characteristics, and it's one of the places that I find their theology most attractive. That is to say, they contend, I think accurately, I'm informed here, they contend that there is an enormous human arrogance in thinking that we who are creatures caught within time, as well, uh, up to 11 dimensions, but caught within time, can in any way assume that we can take God, who is the author of time, who is totally beyond time, and reduce what he has given to human logic so that it makes total sense for us in our limited intelligence. That that is the ultimate desecration of the inspired word of God, to think that we can do that. And so instead they say the Bible is actual. It is our ignorance that keeps us from perceiving all that it's telling us. My story has, I've told this story so many times that it now is being told by everybody. It's the best way I know to talk about the difference between actual and factual. I was in the National Cathedral two or three years ago and so help me, the homilist told my story without a word of citation. I was so annoyed. You know, not, not a word. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and when it was over, and I, we were standing there, and I went through the line to shake his hand, and out of the corner of my mouth, I said, copper, and out of the corner of his mouth, I said, didn't see you, and went right on shaking. Uh, yeah, what can I tell you? But it, it, it's a true story. About 20 years ago, I was asked to come to the cathedral, Anxon Cathedral in Atlanta, Georgia, to talk about the virgin birth, on the basis of what, I know not, because I had no credentials to do it, but nonetheless, I had just gone with Publishers Weekly, and supposedly that gave me the authority to do it. Uh, if you will remember back in the early 90s, those of you who, who were alive and aware then, uh, the virgin birth was a big deal, right? The historicity thereof. If you believed in the historicity of the virgin birth, you were a Christian. If you didn't, you probably were a progressive or an atheist or something, you know? Uh, and so it, if you had said in the average Anglican, uh, or at least Episcopal in my country, uh, on Sunday morning, said in the average nay, those of you who believe in the historicity of the virgin birth get on this side, and those of you who don't believe, get on this side, you'd have had mass chaos in the center aisle simply because nobody was willing to say where he or she stood. It was that hot an issue. So I was there to talk about the virgin birth. And in all fairness, there had been two or three books out that year, and so I was supposed to be doing that. But it was a, a supper meeting, and the young people were serving the dinner. Uh, and uh, when the dinner was over, I stood up to talk, and they, of course, all went back to start scraping the dishes. It's great to be part of the young people in any church. God help them. How any of us survives to be a Christian in adulthood, I don't know. But anyway, um, the... <laughs> They were scraping, and there was this kid, 16, I would bet, maybe 17, and he was scraping away, and the longer I talked, the less he scraped, and finally he just gave the whole thing up and went and sat down in the back of the auditorium in the last row of seats and just listened. When it was all over and the adults had all gone, the kid is still sitting back there, and I go back and I said, uh, how are you? He said, I'm fine. I said, may I help you? And, and he said, 
well, I've got a question. And my immediate reaction is, dear God, his mother's going to call me because I have committed heresy and ruined her son. Uh, and, and I said with great trepidation, what is your question? And he said, well, it's, I don't understand about them. And he pointed to the empty uh, chairs where the adults had been. I said, what don't you understand about them? And he said, I don't understand about them and the virgin birth thing. And I said, what? And he said, direct quote. It's so absolutely beautiful, it has to be true whether it happened or not. That's an emergence answer. That's as near a definition as you're going to get uh, to, uh, to an emergence. That's what they mean by actual instead of factual. Now, what, one of the areas of um, disagreement, of tension, of abrasion between traditional and established church and emergence Christianity in any of its presentations is the fact that a traditional church is unwilling to admit of science, to allow science into its nave, to allow it, by night, into its parish hall, to allow it uh, once a week to have a physicist come talk uh, about what it is. That, that bothers emergence enormously because they say, and they will say with reference to this very thing, if you push him far enough, let's get this really straight. When he said, when Jesus says, you know, that tree right there, if you have enough faith, you can take that tree and you can put it in the ocean right now. It will get up and go. Emergents believe that's true. Most traditional Christians say that's a metaphor, an exaggeration, a literary device. Emergents will say, be careful, be careful. If you hang around another 50 years, we're going to show you the physics that says he's absolutely right. It's a different, it's a huge difference. On that basis, and only 10 minutes off, uh, let's take a break, and I want to come back and do a sociological. And after the sociological, I also want to do one decade with you before lunch, God willing. When someone introduces an individual by saying they need no introduction and then proceeds with a long introduction, um, you're wondering, well, if they didn't need it, why did you do it? Um, Phyllis, your reputation precedes you. And it is because of the wonderful work and ministry that you are doing and the way in which you are challenging the church today that many persons are inspired and excited about what you have to say and what you share. Phyllis, we all know, is an author of many books. Um, Phyllis is certainly a parent, a mother, a wife, a Eucharistic minister, probably have done everything else there is to be done in the Episcopal Church. But I think it is true to say that for us, Phyllis, you are helping us as a pioneer to really come to grips with what it means to be the church in the 21st century. Do not kid ourselves that we are still a church of the last century. And our willingness to be vulnerable, our willingness to recognize the challenge it is before us to be the church today and not to be afraid to be that church because God's church is in God's hands. It's for us simply to allow ourselves to be the vessels and the instruments that God will use to make God's purpose known. And also to be in tune with what probably God has been saying to us, but we are so preoccupied with our own history, selves, the way we are governed, the way we do things, that we do not want to move out of that comfort zone when God is saying to us, trust me, I am with you always. So for this, we we want to say how delighted we are to welcome you here this morning, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to address this gathering. Let's welcome for this among us. <laughs> I want to do the introduction again. <laughs> I loved it, I have to tell you. I also want to tell you that the Reformation was not in vain. I have in my hand, a, a, oh, there's one back there. I didn't see the clock. I was with the Nebraska Synod of Lutherans about three or four months ago in a room that didn't have a clock. 
And after three hours, I was still talking, and they finally began to get a little restless. And uh, as we were leaving from that three hours before we went back to the afternoon session, they gave me a watch and said, take it wherever you go, it's got a big face, <laughs> which I thought was about as subtle as anything Luther ever did, uh, you know. <laughs> but I can see that one, so I will leave my watch even. Um, and uh, I, I, do, I sort of have a theory that, that the mind can retain only what the bladder can contain. So when, when we've gone too long, just let me know. Theoretically, I'm going to stop at 11 o'clock, but it's very theoretical. Uh, Rector was concerned a little bit. I'm supposed to be up here. I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Rector was concerned about Q&A as well he should be. Yes, there will be Q&A. Uh, I ask your indulgence, though, if you will let me set up a few things, which will probably take our first session, uh, and then we will ha have some Q&A. And it may not. I may be able to condense it a little bit. But if you can bear with me just listening for a, a little while until we get some, some groundwork, uh, and then I think we'll have a more productive Q&A. Um, I want to begin this morning a little bit autobiographically, which... Uh, always troubles me a little bit, but on the other hand, I'm a little more troubled by not beginning that way. Uh, I, I'm a recovering academic. It's a circumstance nobody ever gets over. <laughs> you're gonna, I never saw a footnote I didn't love, um, you know, and, and, and you're going to catch that. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, I, I loved teaching college until I became an academic dean, and that just kills it right there. And after six years, I woke up one morning and thought, if I have to chair another curriculum committee meeting, I'm going to kill somebody. And I knew it was time to quit. Uh, and I went from the academy to book publishing um, and was head of a, of a number of southern houses as they got bought and sold like that for some 35 or, or, or so years, maybe 38 years, I don't know. Um, and then uh, in 1989, 90. Uh, retired at the age of 59, uh, I'm older than God, but um, retired in order to write. I don't know what I think a writer is, but I think someday I'm going to learn to do it. 30 books later, uh, I still haven't figured out what it is to do that. Anyway, uh, it lasted for 13 months. It lasted for 13 months because a phone call came from Publishers Weekly. Publishers Weekly is uh, the trade journal for uh, the book industry in, uh, essentially in the English language, uh, regardless of the country in which it happens. Um, and it was uh, from a woman whom I knew by name because it had been my trade journal for those 35, 36 years. I knew her by name, but not personally in any way. Uh, and she said, we did the usual amenities, and then she said, will you come out of retirement for 18 months and establish a religion department for us? And I said, what? And she said, we've never had a religion department as Publishers Weekly, which I knew, because we've never had any need for one. There's never been any major book publishing in religion done by commercial houses. And as you must be aware, religion books are now leading uh, all of the bestseller list, and I was aware of that, of course. Um, I should say that Harper and Random House had both done some religion publishing, uh, both in our country and the Random House division in yours. Um, but it was primarily for professional people. It was not for John Q. Public. And uh, Daisy Merrillis was absolutely right. Starting by 89, 90, uh, 91, along in there, you see the huge surge in the commercial publishing of religion. It wasn't going to uh, denominational houses. It was going commercial. It was going because we were having some sort of, of sea change, if you will, a shift in what was happening in, in the culture. And so the fact of it is that uh, in 92-93, Ingram Book Company, which is the largest distributor of books in the continent, uh, probably in the world, everything in your country and in mine that goes to a library, if it goes to you through Amazon, doesn't matter how it goes, goes ultimately through Ingram before it gets to you they had a 243% increase in one fiscal year in the movement of religion products to the countries, to the nation's uh, markets. That's a huge increase. It's a malignant one. When you get that kind of increase, you have to do something. And so it was that uh, Publishers Weekly had to establish a religion department. And indeed, I said, having been reared as a Presbyterian, I got over it when I was 17, but I was reared as a Presbyterian, um, and so I said to her, let me think about it. I have to pray about it. And she said, oh, God. Uh, and, 
so uh, a month later she called and said, well, we can't wait any longer. And I knew when I got on the airplane, I was going to do it. Uh, and indeed, Publishers Weekly had been around 135 years at that point. It was owned out of Amsterdam by Reeves Elsevier. And I walked in, and they literally said, the old line, here's the checkbook, uh, do what you have to do, but get us a department in 18 months. Uh, and in 18 months, any fool, especially one that's been an academic dean, can establish a department in a well-established magazine. There's not much trick to it. Um, and so we were doing it. But, and the point of all this is, in 18 months, it was very clear that what the industry needed, what Publishers Weekly needed, was not a religion department, though we had that. What they needed was the answer to a very fundamental question. Booksellers and librarians and acquisition editors and publishers, the publishers especially, were calling and there was no politeness about it. They basically said over and over again, tell us what the hell is going on. Because the shift was that dramatic. And when you have that kind of growth, commercially speaking, if you have that kind of growth, you're in real trouble unless you can figure out why it's happening and can do something about it. So within 18 months, I essentially left the position as, I kept the title, but left the position as editor of the religion department and went back to the scholarship, back to the place I thought I had left some 40 years earlier. And the scholarship was there, and it was very clear what we were going through and that it had a pattern to it. Uh, and there was no question about it. The thing about it is, Academic material doesn't matter when academics are talking to academics. It never escapes the uh, academy. But when it takes on a commercial edge, then all of a sudden it begins to seep out and take some urgency, and the scholarship begins to matter. And so I have spent the last 20 years of my life as a student of emergence Christianity, which is what we're here to talk about today. That long story is a way of saying, uh, begging you, Number one, please don't confuse the messenger with the message. This is not necessarily an endorsement or a lack of endorsement of emergence Christianity. This is an attempt to, to talk about what's happening and why it's happening and where I think it's going and why it matters to all of us. This is also to say, please understand, that I'm not trying to persuade you of anything. I'm just trying to lay out the facts in such a way that they may or may not be useful to you in, in what you do. I can make you a laundry list of things that concern me about emergence Christianity. I'm not going to because it's a waste of time right now. But there are things that, that concern me, things where I think there's a, uh, an inherent weakness or something we should be concerned about. Uh, and emergence Christians know that. Nonetheless, all of that is a way of sort of setting uh, some framework for it. So together we're going to look at emergence Christianity. And it's G-E-N-C-E. -E. This did not matter until about 18 months ago. And now it matters terribly. We are here to talk about emergence Christianity. G-E-N-C-E. -E. Not emerging, not emergent. None of those words. It's emergence Christianity when you're talking about the overall thing. Now, the central thesis here is well known to some of you because I've already seen some familiar faces. And you've heard the central thesis, or you've read some of the material, either mine or, or uh, someone else's. Uh, the central thesis is that about every 500 years, for some reason, about every 500 years, Latinized Christianity, or that part of the world that received its Christianity through the Latin language, goes through a major upheaval. I don't care whether you call it an upheaval, or a reformation, or a tsunami, or whatever you call it. About every 500 years, we go through a great whoopee, if that is a better term, all right? That is to say, we're in the 21st century right now, and if you go back 500 years, you hit the 16th century, no surprise to anybody, and we called it the Great Reformation, right? If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the 11th century, and we called it the Great Schism or the Great Schism, according to where your mama grew up and how she taught you to say it, but it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the 6th century and uh, the Great Decline and Fall. And of course, if you go back 500 from that, you hit the 1st century and what's called the Great Transformation or the Great Transition, one or the other. Both terms apply. They all have picked up their greats. Now, in the beginning, uh, only this great schism was great. Now they're all great because it makes academics happy if everything's fine. So don't leave the greats off. They really matter. Uh, 
who knows why. We're living in the great emergence. When I say that it happens, it happens not just to the people of God who are involved, and it happens in very specific cultural contexts. That is to say, it happens in that part of the world that was susceptible to receiving its Christianity through the Latin language as opposed to the Syriac and the Greek, or was colonized by those who so received, or was colonialized by those who so received. That is to say, what I have just said sounds a whole lot like westernized world or like first world. Be really careful. That's not true. It's the colonialized and the colonized that also matter. Emergence Christianity came to this continent last. We are the last to receive it. If you want to see it in some of its earlier forms, look, for instance, in South Africa. You can go home and Google Amahoro, A-M-A-H-O-R-O. That's emergence Christianity as it has existed in South Africa for some 40 or 50 years now. Why was it there? Because they had been colonialized uh, by those who received their Christianity through the Latin language. If you want to see it in Malaysia, where it's been quite active for 30 years, it's oh, Malaysia, which I can't spell, but I love to say because it clears the throat. Uh, but but it, it's absolutely there. So it comes to us last. What matters is that we understand this is not a first world phenomenon. This is a phenomenon of, of mindset, if you will, of cultures that were receptive to Latinized Christianity as opposed to other forms of Christianity. And so... Why, why is it that we're susceptible to the 500-year thing? Nobody knows. In all probability, and my undergraduate work was in language, and as many of you know, a language shapes how you think, but in the, it works the other way too. You are susceptible to or receptive of a language if it matches the way in which you think. It's a catch and catch can, or like this. So that there is a segment of the world primarily around the Mediterranean, that was more susceptible to a Latinized way of thinking than to a Syriac or to a Greek way of thinking. And so those cultures that came out of that and received their Christianity through that mechanism or thought in such a way that they could receive it, go through this thing. Now having said that very elaborate thing, if there were a rabbi in the room, which I take it there's not, if there were a rabbi in the room, he or she would rise up immediately and say, whoa, it's not a Christian thing you're talking about. It's a Judeo-Christian thing you're talking about. The same 500-year period uh, uh, or cycle also occurs in Judaism. If you go back 500 years from this right here, you hit, of course, the, the Babylonian captivity, the destruction of the temple, and the birth of Second Temple Judaism. If you go back 500 years from that, you hit the end of the Davidic dynasty, uh, of, of uh, the age of judges, and the beginning of the Davidic dynasty, out of which Meshul was to come. So they argue very cogently. They argue that uh, because they are in that part, they came from that part of the world that was susceptible to Latinization, that it is a Judeo-Christian phenomenon. If there were an Iman in the room, and I've been interrupted three or four times over the last few years, so I always say it now instead, he would rise up and say, you're not talking about a Judeo-Christian phenomenon, you're talking about an Abrahamic phenomenon. Uh, and he would argue that um, if you start at 650, the year of our Lord 650, Islam evidences the same 500-year cycle. Uh, they choose 650 because at 650, when you can honestly say, now there is a religion. By 650 of the Common Era, the prophet has dead, of course, and Jerusalem has fallen. Nonetheless, it's about 650 before you can say there is an Islam. Here, here is a religion. We, we can define it. We can see it. And if you go 500 years from 650 and 1,000 and, and now 50, um, 1,500, you will see the same cycling. Um, it's important, I think, uh, for our purposes to understand what the Imams are saying simply because it puts a different perspective on Arab Spring. They are arguing now that they are going through a period not unlike our 15th century, that Islam is entering a time of reformation analogous to what we did 500 years ago. Uh, and there is a good deal of scholarship. If you want to go home and, and see what it's look, uh, look at um, the work of Muhammad Iqbal, uh, I-Q-B-A-L, uh, who is being called now the Martin Luther of contemporary Islam. Or look at uh, Abdul Karman uh, Sarush, S-O-R-O-U-C-A-S-H, um, at, uh, at his work. 
he too is a scholar and they, they are um, concerned now with shaping what Islam is going to be after it goes through this time of reformation and are arguing that what we're seeing in Arab Spring is, is nothing in the world but that same 500 year cycle. Um, the 500 year cycle, let me say, one of you, uh, Phil Cooper, uh, whom I don't see right, but um, Phil was laughing about he had been with Diana Butler Bass last week. Uh, there are um, many um, historians, and she always reminds me of this, trained historians who get really upset about cycles. Um, they, there is, especially older historians, um, say, you know, cycles can become uh, historic determinism. Be careful about their being there, and they're absolutely right. Having said that, however, let me also go forth and say that systems theory, which is a fairly new division of, uh, of, of science, Systems theory has a very uh, a complicated mathematical explanation for why we do this thing every 500 years. And they say, absolutely, it will probably continue. We are trapped in some kind of, of thing. So it's going to continue to go around. I, I received a letter uh, last week from a young man whom I had known when he was in seminary. And he said, this will either spook you or confirm you or just simply turn you off. Uh, but I am preaching on the second kings. And I discovered that in 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, the first verse, uh, it, it, very quiet, uh, it very quietly says that um, uh, 480 years after the exile, uh, Solomon decided to build a temple. And I thought, 480 years, isn't that interesting? And then if you go to 2 Kings 9, 10, you discover that it was 20 years building and 500 years after the return from exile, he consecrated the temple. Uh, and he said, if that doesn't spook you, then, you know, there you are. Uh, and I said, all right, I think it may spook me. It's a little too much. It's like, uh, you know, some kinds of prophecy that make you nervous. N uh, nonetheless, uh, the 500-year thing is there. What we have to remember about it is that it's not just about religion. Because we are people involved in religion, we tend to see these things in terms of religion. It is instead... Everything in the society involved changes, including religion. That is to say, the Reformation is better known to us than many other things. So let's take the Reformation. If you will remember, even in high school, when they taught you the Reformation, they said, the Reformation, uh, it is the birth of individualism. Uh, it is uh, the coming of humanism. It's the beginning of a new renaissance. It is the rise of the middle class. It's the institutionalization of capitalism. It's the rise of the nation state, right? Remember all these things? And oh, by the way, it brought us Protestantism. We are in a thing called the great emergence, and it's affecting every single part of what we do. And by the way, it's bringing us emergence Christianity, all right? We have to keep the emphasis in the right place. Society informs the religion that exists in it, and religion is informed by and informs the society. It's a two-way street. You cannot separate the two. It is the function of religion to inform and give meaning to the society in which it exists, but it is the function of the society also to shape religion. So you're not going to ex uh, extrapolate. You're not going to pull Protestantism out of the Reformation. You're not going to pull emergence Christianity out of the great emergence. But you have to understand that it's far more than just religion. The great emergence, uh, the great emergence in which we live, is it simply a time in which everything has so dramatically changed that your grandfather, or at the most your great-grandfather, could no more endure or live in the world you live in right now than he could fly to the moon, right? It has changed that much. It is the great, emer it is the thing after it is the great emergence that Thomas Friedman, 10 years ago, could write a book called The World is Flat, and we all knew what he was talking about. It's the great emergence that you and I, speaking English, have five times more words than William Shakespeare had when he wrote the plays, for goodness sakes. It's the great emergence that, in, in my country, in 1900, there were 8,000 cars total in the whole country. There are 8,000 years of cars between here and Young Avenue, for goodness sakes, right now, right. It, it's the great emergence that the average Caucasian male only lived to be 47 years old uh, in 1900. And, and, and now we live forever, right? It's a condition we probably should not have acquired. Uh, you know, we might have been better off without it. Uh, it. It's the great emergence 
that if you read the New York Times on uh, the day after tomorrow, from cover to cover, you're going to be exposed to more information than the average privileged 19th century gentleman had in his whole lifetime. You will also need a stiff drink when you finish, but that's a different issue. <laughs> yeah, it's more than you ever wanted to know. It's the great, it, it, it's the, it's the great emergence it's the great emergence that in my country, um, this year, 2012, 